Today's lecture is uh, entitled Ode to a Nightingale by John Keats. Uh, you remember from the previous lecture, uh, which was about Ode to the West Wind, uh, the definition of the word Ode, what does it mean? It means a lyrical poem uh, in which the poet addresses someone or something. Uh, he's as if he's talking to the to the uh, thing or he's addressing or sometimes he's uh, trying to uh, make an apostrophe uh, which is called in Arabic uh, munajat apostrophe and here in this poem we see that it is an ode to a nightingale a nightingale you know is a kind of singing birds uh, it is very remarkable and known for its beautiful song uh, so you see again here, uh, just like many other romantic poets that we have already studied, John Keats, who is one of the second generation of the romantic poets, uh, also uh, goes back to nature. And here we have this creature. The nightingale is an element uh, which is part of nature. So before we start with the poem, let's see something about the poem. The poem was inspired by the song of a nightingale, which the poet heard in the garden of his friends. So one day, uh, as John Keats was in his friend's house in the morning, he heard this beautiful song of the bird as he was sitting there in the breakfast. Uh, and actually he was so attracted to this song, uh, to the extent that he took his chair and put, put it under the tree and as he was listening he composed the poem. So you see here we have an element of nature which inspired the poet in order to write his poem. And you remember that we said one of the qualities of the romantic poetry is uh, that it is based on personal experiences. And here we have a very personal experience that the poet goes through and then he narrates it uh, in, uh, in a poem. So this is, uh, this is a brief background about the poem so that we understand how it is written. Another thing which is important that we, sh we should know is that the poet's sadness uh, over the death of his brother and his sad experience in love caused him to feel pessimistic and depressed. And this is something that we are going to notice throughout the poem, that uh, although the poet is listening to a happy song by the bird, uh, but he feels very depressed and sad. And uh, as you see here, there is a reason for that. So although he's listening to the joyful song of the bird, the poet was uh, we can say in pain, he was pessimistic, he was deeply sad because of his tragic experiences. Uh, so this is mainly what we need to know about uh, the poem before we start with it. So let's see what the poem is about. And you remember also, uh, here we have the text on this side, we have the text, and here on this side, we have a brief explanation and you can follow by colors. You see here uh, the, the yellow section, the text. Here we have also a yellow section, which is the explanation. So you have to follow the colors so that you understand each part of the poem with uh, its explanation. So let's see here the first stanza. And by the way, the poem is, uh, is very long. I think it's uh, maybe eight parts, uh, eight sections, uh, and we are going just to uh, analyze four sections. The first one, uh, and then we have, um, I, I think it's the, the, the third one, and then we are going to jump into the, uh, the seventh and the eighth, the, the last one. So we are taking parts of the poem, not the whole poem. So let's start with the first section, or let's say the first uh, stanza. My heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains, my sense as though of hemlock I had drunk, or emptied some dull opiate to the drains 
One minute passed and Lee Thwarts had sunk. So th from the very beginning, the poet is ex uh, explaining here what he feels. He's, he's talking about some kind of feeling that he has. He says, my heart aches. He feels kind of pain. And this pain is really deep in his heart. And a drowsy numbness. Drowsy numbness. So this feeling, being a drowsy, uh, and drowsy, if you look it in the dictionary, uh, it is somehow kind of feeling asleep or sleepy. Uh, so this kind of feeling, uh, how, when, when do you feel like this? Uh, he, here he gives an example. He said, as though of hemlock I had drunk. He, he says that this feeling, you feel it when you uh, maybe are under the influence of some kind of poison like hemlock. Uh, it is not only a uh, usual pain, it is kind of numbness, numbness, you see? He says, uh, the pain that I feel here, the pain that he explained in the first line, uh, he says, I, I feel like this as if I, I have drunk some kind of poison, like hemlock, or emptied some dull opiate to the drains. Uh, he says... Uh, it is also uh, somehow similar to the feeling of taking drugs, opiate. Here, opiate, this is, this is the same as opium, uh, someone who has taken drugs. So you see here the explanation says his heart is in pain and his body feels numb and tired. He feels like he's drunk from the poisonous hemlock plant or like he's just taken some kind of drug and fallen into the waters leave not only pain uh, what he feels he also says one minute passed and leith words had sunk so he also feels as if he had sunk in leith words what is leith words here you, you see the definition leith words actually is a river in the ancient greek mythology uh, and it is placed in the underworld uh, according to the mythology, when you drink from this river, you forget everything. You see, uh, in, in mythology, the dead people, when they go under uh, the underworld, when they drink from this river, they forget everything about uh, their life when they were alive. So he, he, he sees, uh, sorry, he uh, describes actually his feeling, uh, it is pain we can say it is numbness uh, it is kind of drowsiness and at a certain point uh, he feels that uh, it makes him forget everything about his life what is the reason behind all these feelings what is the reason behind this pain let's see here it is not through envy of thy happy lot but being too happy in thine happiness that thou you see here thou means you this is an old form so he's talking to someone here and of course we know uh, from the title that he's talking to the bird so here we understand from this part here from this sentence that he uh, he's uh, addressing or he's uh, talking to the bird uh, so the reason behind these feelings these let's say this mixture of feelings pain um, and drowsiness and forgetfulness the mixture of feeling is caused by what by listening to the bird song how can uh, how can we explain this uh, the poet although he's listening to a beautiful song he feels sad instead of feeling happy let's say if uh, let's see if we can explain this so in these two lines what does he say or what does it mean he says So the poet claims that he is not envy, or he doesn't, sorry, feel envy uh, of the bird's happiness. So singing, uh, usually in literature we notice that whenever singing is mentioned, it indicates happiness, uh, or it is associated with happiness. Uh, the poet here claims that uh, the bird is happier than him. 
or maybe uh, he he's trying to combine or he's trying to find a, a relationship between the bird's happiness and his own sadness so he's he uh, when he's listening to the bird song he he's telling the bird that he doesn't feel jealous of the bird's happiness uh, on the contrary he feels happy for the bird because it can sing freely and beautifully so you see here uh, this element of nature here uh, it reminds the poet uh, of his sadness but in what way in, in, in a way that uh, makes him uh, feel or realize that uh, in nature things uh, are much happier than in human life you see and then he said that thou light winged dryad you notice here this description of the bird light winged dryad what does it mean notice here in, in the uh, notes you are like a dryad what is a dryad a dryad is a mythical tree spirit in mythology actually they believed that uh, the trees were inhabited with uh, small creatures spirits see so here he described the bird as if it is a kind of a spirit which lives in the tree see in your patch of overgrown greenery and shadows singing summer song with all your might so here if we continue here light-winged dryad of the trees in some melodious plot of beech and green and shadows numberless sings of summer in full-throated ease so uh, the poet uh, sees that the bird is really happy and he he's trying uh, to enjoy this happiness but at the same time it is causing him sadness you see there is this combination of contrastive feelings uh, sometimes we uh, we use expressions like for example we say that someone is painfully happy see how can someone be happy and feel pain at the same time you see so uh, there is this contrastive kind of feelings that the poet is having at the same time uh, and this is what makes this poem uh, really interesting let's see in the next section which is uh, i guess this is the third one fade far away dissolve and quite forget what thou among the leaves hast never known the weariness the fever and the fret here where men sit and hear each other groan again you see when he when he is talking like this when he says fade far away dissolve and quite forget he's talking to the bird as if he's he's demanding or he's asking the bird to uh, to keep itself away from from where from the world of human beings fade far away from this world dissolve keep yourself away forget what thou among the leaves has never known so because the bird lives in the trees live in the forest in nature it doesn't have the chance uh, to experience because it is another creature which lives in nature it doesn't have this uh, let's say uh, capacity or uh, ability to feel what human beings suffer doesn't know these things about human life so you see the poet wishes to forget himself and escape from the world of humans which is filled with sadness sickness and despair why what is so bad about the world of humans according to the poet it is filled with what weariness fever and fret what is so uh, yeah, or what is the uh, thing which uh, let's say distinguishes the world of humans it is filled with uh, sickness it is filled with uh, weariness uh, people most of the time uh, they sit look at this line they sit and hear each other groan they are complaining all the time groaning speaking about their pains their sadness their sickness uh, their let's say sad experiences in love let's say their uh, their loss of, of loved people so it is not a world which we find happiness just like the world of the nightingale 
which is filled with singing, which is filled with freedom. The, the bird can fly anywhere. Uh, it can sing at any time. Uh, it lives free of, of uh, being worried or uh, free of uh, the fear of loss, not like human beings. And notice here, again, he's, he's talking about the world of humans. He says, where palsy shakes a few sad last gray hairs. What happens to people when, they, when, when time passes? They get old. And when they get old, it, it means that they are uh, becoming closer to death. Uh, you see, palsy. Palsy is kind of, of sickness or disease. When, when people get old in this world of humans, uh, old people... See, when he says here, gray hairs, he, he's talking about old people. What happened to them? They are attacked by sickness. And what about the young? Is it just the old who get sick? Of course not. Where youth also, what happens to youth? Where youth grows pale and specter thin and dies. And from this line, we can understand that the poet is actually referring to his, his young brother. We said that uh, his young brother died because of sickness, you see, and, and the young becomes pale and finally dies. So in this world, we have this sickness and death which, uh, which attacks people from different ages. What else? Where but to think is to be full of sorrow. So just thinking, just the act of thinking can make one sad. See, this is, this, this is one of the characteristics of the world of humans. And leaden-eyed despairs. You see, when you look at someone uh, who's really depressed, you, you notice their eyes, uh, they are half closed, half open. Uh, such eyes are described like this, leaden-eyed, as if they are, <clears throat> uh, they are filled with lead. You know this material, lead, it, when it is... It's very heavy metal, so uh, as if these eyes uh, are loaded with this kind of metal. <clears throat> uh, because uh, the, the person feels really depressed. Where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes, or new love pine at them beyond tomorrow. So in the human world, beauty never lasts. Even those, let's say... Uh, these values, spiritual values, like beauty, like love, even these things, they never last. So this is here, we can say that in this section, the, the poet is trying to show the difference between the world of the nightingale and the world of humans. And of course, which one is, uh, uh, is better, we can say. It is, of course, the world of the nightingale. Uh, the next section, which is the seventh one, the one before the last one, again he's addressing the bird, but in what way? Thou wast not born for death, immortal bird. You see, immortal. On what, in what way can the bird be immortal? <clears throat> uh, of course, not. Uh, it doesn't mean that the bird doesn't die. Actually, it dies, but... The bird has this quality of being immortal, but how? No hungry generations tread thee down. The voice I hear. The voice I hear this passing night was heard in ancient days by emperor and clown. So the bird is immortal through what? Through its voice, its song. The song here, or oh, what does this mean? The song I hear is the same one heard many, many years ago in the time of emperors and court jesters. So birds, and especially the nightingale, uh, they, they are creatures which live on earth since ancient times, and they have these beautiful songs, which everyone from the ancient times heard, everyone from uh, the, the present time, is hearing and people in future also are going to hear the same song so this same song which is uh, one of the qualities of the nightingale this song uh, is immortal so what makes the bird immortal is the song 
perhaps the self-same song that found a path through the sad heart of Ruth when sick for home. Here the poet is giving us a biblical allusion. He's referring to a character from uh, the Bible. Her name is Ruth. I I'm not quite sure about uh, the story of this character, but uh, she is known for feeling homesick. She was away from her home country and she felt homesickness. And the poet here is referring to this character. Uh, he's saying that maybe she heard the song of the bird and this uh, song uh, made her have these feelings of homesickness towards her home country. So here you see in these lines, what do they mean? Perhaps it is even unchanged. You see this ancient song. Uh, since biblical times when Ruth, who stuck by her mother-in-law after she herself was widowed, stood in fields of corn and she was listening maybe to this song and this song reminded her of her home country. So what the poet is trying to say, to say here is that the, uh, the song of the bird uh, is immortal. It lives through times. Uh, it has this ability to inspire feelings like homesickness, to inspire feelings like, for example, uh, equality. Uh, <clears throat> so it is not a usual uh, song, it is a magical one. The same that oft times hath charmed magic casements opening on the foam of perilous seas in fairy lands forlorn. So this song has a special charm which has or which can what can open windows to dangerous seas it could be heard in forlorn lands <clears throat> uh, so here uh, here uh, the, the the song is not only a usual one it is a magical one you see it's kind of exaggeration of course the poet is trying uh, to exaggerate the meaning of of the song of the bird but notice here this word for loan and I have made it uh, with the yellow color why because you are going to see that this word here this is the last one here and it's going to be the first one in the next stanza here see for loan why when he said in the, in the previous section when he said for loan as if this word was kind of a bell it reminded him of something when he said forlorn and suddenly maybe he remembered something when he heard the word. Why? <clears throat> Notice here he says the very word is like a bell and usually when do we use bells or when we when you listen or when you hear the sound of a bell it is kind of alert. It, it uh, attracts your attention to something. When we ring a bell we are trying to attract <clears throat> the attention of people to something. So here the word for loan uh, act just like a bell. It it actually uh, reminded the poet of something. What is this thing? Or uh, what is the thing that the attention of the poet is reminded with? To toll me back from the from thee to my soul self. So this word for loan has reminded the poet that most of the time he was living in a magical or a fancy or imaginative world. It is the world of the nightingale. But reality is that he has to go back to real life. You see, adieu. Adieu means goodbye. Adieu. The fancy cannot cheat so well as she is famed to do. Deceiving, deceiving elf. <clears throat> Here, deceiving elf is a description of what? Of fancy. He describes fancy, imagination. Fancy means imagination. <clears throat> he describes fancy as a deceiving elf. It deceives you, it cheats you, it makes you believe that what you are thinking of, the, the imaginary places or things that you are thinking of are real. But here the, the poet claims, <clears throat> you see, that he is not to be 
tricked by his imagination and believed that he could run away from reality. Because after all, we all know that we cannot run away or escape from reality. Uh, we can't. We cannot most of the time live in imagination. And you see, the, the romantic poets actually were escapists. They are sometimes they are called escapists. Why they are called like this? Because instead of facing reality, they run away. They escape through poetry, through personal experiences, through imagination. <clears throat> sometimes even through supernatural settings or characters or places, they run away from reality of life. Uh, but here the poet claims that he is not to be cheated or tricked by imagination. You see, adieu, adieu. So again, he's saying goodbye. Thy plaintive anthem. Anthem means song. Thy plaintive anthem fades. Why does it fade? Because probably the bird, of course, it, it's not going to stand on that tree forever. So the bird flew away and as it is flying away, the song starts to fade, to disappear. <clears throat> past the near meadows, over the still stream, up the hillside, and now it is buried deep. So where, where does it go, the song? see it means that who's going to listen to the song now the, the next place that the bird is going to so it seems here you see it seems that the bird flew away and its song sorry here this one it's <clears throat> its song is fading it's now heard in the near meadows and rivers somewhere in the valleys and forests so the, the bird has gone far away to nature, to some other place in nature. Uh, and as its song is fading, our speaker, our poet is going back to reality. He's leaving the world uh, of imagination, the world of fancy, uh, of the nightingale, and he's going back to real life. Now notice these two last lines, they are really interesting. Was it a vision or a waking dream? He's asking questions here. Flit is that music. Now the song has gone away. The music, the sound, the beautiful song has gone away. <clears throat> Do I wake or sleep? Wh why is asking these questions? Or what, do what does it mean when he says, Do I wake or sleep? Uh, these two lines actually highlight a very important point, which is what? How do we... How do we understand uh, the separation, let's say, or the line which separates fancy from reality? Uh, how do we understand at which point what we see is, uh, is real or it is imagination? Or how can we understand, for example, that now I am awake and what I see is real? something from being awake or what I see is part of a dream maybe or because I am asleep I imagine things so the, the poet here is asking a, you can say kind of a philosophical question was this whole experience real or an illusion the nightingale song has gone am I awake or asleep maybe uh, was I asleep and then uh, suddenly I woke up or maybe what we live in reality is sleeping actually we are asleep in real life maybe you are asleep and when we go to imagination it is the, the place or it is in imagination that we are able to be awake as much as we want we are able to live dreams as much as we want you see because you know the nature of dreams the nature of imagination is that we have freedom more freedom than what we have in reality so uh, this kind of uh, ideas uh, actually the, the romantic poets were mo mostly engaged with such uh, ideas of how to distinguish between reality and appearances how to distinguish or how to know that which one is real imagination is real or 
what we see in real life you see so here the, the the question in the end is really interesting because it gives another dimension to this poem okay so uh, this was in brief uh, an explanation of ode to a nightingale uh, i'm going to give you some questions about the poem and uh, if you of course if you have your own questions uh, if you haven't understand something, you can ask me at any time. So thank you very much for listening.